half in the bag. Close down the cinemas. Ah, it's nice to have a cup of warm, hot coffee on these sub-zero March days. Hey, spring's here. It's finally 12 degrees out. Is it 12 out? It's all the way up to 12. We're, we're set for summer. I gotta get on my bathing suit. Oh, phone's ringing. Oh. <clears throat> Lightning fast VCR repair. This is Mike. How can I help you? What? No. Get lost. Go fuck yourself. I paid my bills. <laughs> Bill collectors. They say I owe money to Netflix. It's like I keep telling them Netflix is free. Oh, that reminds me. You know, everybody's talking about the hot new Jordan Peele horror film. It was a big hit at the box office over the weekend. So let's discuss an indie cancer drama that was dumped on Netflix. All right, listen, how about this? How about I'm going to make a statement? And if it's a true statement, then you don't have to correct me. Is what Michael has incurable? Yeah, that's a question. Paddleton is a movie you haven't seen. It's on Netflix, along with a bunch of other movies that they drop on there and don't tell you about and you don't know exists. Until one of your coworkers says, hey, did you see Paddleton? And you say, I've never even heard of that. Is it in the theaters? And they say, no, it's on Netflix. And you say, oh, where on Netflix? I don't see it in any of the thumbnails. All I see is The Office over and over and over. And it's about a guy dying of cancer. Welcome to our comedy review show, Paddleton. Mike, uh, before we say what we thought about Paddleton, why are we talking about a, a little film called Paddleton? Well, Jay, uh, oftentimes I browse around uh, trailers, movie trailers. Uh, uh, you can you can find clickbait articles, top twenty movies that are on Netflix right now, and that's that's kind of where you can hear about little Netflix gems. Top ten movies you haven't heard of. Right, that and most most times they're movies you've heard of. Yeah. And the Oscar goes to Roma! But then there are uh, apps with, with movie trailers. There's websites, uh, movie trailers. And, and so I, I, I actually, instead of ha letting the advertising come to me, I sometimes go to the advertising. And I watch trailers and I go, nope, nope, nope. Um, although Ray Romano, who stars in Paddleton with uh, Mark Duplass, mm -hmm. was on uh, the Conan O'Brien show. But I don't think is that any, still on? I don't think anybody watches that. Is the Conan O'Brien show dumped on Netflix? I think he's on TBS, but he, he's dropped this format of like late night talk show host with the desk. And it's like, it, it looks like in between two ferns with Zach <laughs> Gilfrey. He's just, he's just chilling. They're just oh, chilling really? in chairs. Okay. And there's no desk. There's no pretense. There's, I just really remember just, when the It looks whole, like a podcast, but, I, but it's Conan. I just remember when the whole like uh, Jay Leno Conan thing happened and everyone was pissed off at Jay Leno for, for ruining Conan. Conan's big break, yeah. and then Conan was not allowed to be on television for like a year, and then he came back, and everyone was like, he's back, he's on TBS, but he's back, Conan's back. And everybody watched him that first night he was back, and then nobody's watched him since. But yeah, Ray Romano was on there, and he, he like spoiled the entire ending of the movie and stuff. I, I saw it after the fact. Oh, okay. But I saw the trailer for this, and I was like, all right, all right, Ray Romano has had a bit of a renaissance. Yeah. A Romanaissance. So uh, that's the reason we're talking about this movie. You just wanted to make that one joke. I did. Uh, he was in his, his first feature film debut after his hit television series, Everybody Loves Ray Romano, <laughs> was called Welcome to Mooseport, and it flopped, and then nobody heard about Ray Romano for 43 years. Then he came back in a movie called The Big Sick. Very good film. Um, and you're like, Ray Romano. And then I saw, and I saw him in this trailer, and I was like, I, li I like him. He's a charming man. Yeah. And uh, he's he's in an indie mumblecore movie. I, I tend to be drawn to that kind of thing when like a like a broad comedy guy is like, I'm going to make a depressing, feel-bad movie. Yeah. They, they usually bring something to it that just a regular dramatic actor doesn't. Yeah. If there's anyone who is, who is born to do mumblecore, <laughs> it's Ray Romano. Because I learned from his interview that almost this entire movie was improv. Oh, really? It was like, like Mark Duplass is like, yeah, yeah, here's a couple, of, here's an outline. Okay. Here's the scene. Uh, and he has some funny anecdotes about it. But the premise of the movie is uh, two guys, they're, they're very, very simple men, um, poor, 
Uh, they're neighbors. They're just friends. Living in an apartment complex. One lives above the yeah, other. Yeah, kind of a dirty, gross apart apartment complex. And uh, one of them gets diagnosed with terminal cancer. And the, the premise of the movie is uh, we have to go get a drug that will kill me. What do they call it? Assisted suicide, right? It's legal in Seattle. They should tell some of the homeless about that. <laughs> Jesus, it just comes out. Oh, my God. Um, it's the most horrendous thing you've ever said in the last five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed into my own coffee. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I watched this movie and it, it was like, it's such a simple movie with, with such uh, really kind of nice, simple characters in such a lighthearted tone. And it gets so fucking dark and depressing yeah. that it, it, it's, it's really amazing. And that's why I wanted to do this movie because I have to, I have to make a formal public apology to Mark Duplass because I found myself over the last handful of years, ever since we reviewed Jeff, He Who Lives at Home, <laughs> the worst fucking movie ever made. That's, that's one of our very, very early episodes. Oh, and God. I, I did not like the movie. You flat out hated it. I think it was probably one of your most hated movies at the time. It was an atrocious... A uh, pretentious nightmare. And the I Duplass brothers, it. we've looked up interviews and stuff with them, and they came across like the douchiest, yes. smarmiest assholes. Right. You know, as much as we are quote unquote improvising, things tend to stay on the rails of the narrative path. It's just a question of like getting there in the most organic and fresh way possible. Jay and I both drive Priuses. We actually use no blocking on our sets. What I happens if, if you're shooting the, your uh, master and one of your actors is having their moment right there? You're on a wide lens. Right. You're fucked, you know? They both act, they both write, they both direct. Jay, Jay Duplass was on Transparent. Um, Mark Duplass, like, he'll act in things, he'll write stuff, he'll direct stuff, he'll just... Just does a bunch of everything. A true renaissance man. I, li I like him in those creep films. I don't know if you've seen those. Yeah, yeah. Very, uh, I've seen the first one. That, that's, that's sort of like mumblecore horror. It's always like these ideas where it's like the simplest idea and it's just observing a person at this very kind of narrow point in their life. Yes. Um, which is what the creep movies kind of are. Uh, even though they're horror films, found footage horror films. Yeah. Uh, and that's what this movie is too. And that's what kind of works to its advantage. Mm -hmm. uh, just the simplicity of it and the strength of not only the performances, especially Ray Romano, but also their, uh, their relationship. Uh, it's like they're, they're very simple men. They're not complicated people. There's no uh, big emotional speeches in the film. Right. It's not melodramatic. It's, it's not terms of endearment. Right. Um, and, and, and Ray Romano is just like, you know, you know, Mark Duplass is the more kind of like level-headed guy. He's not like a smart guy. He's real simple. But uh, but Ray Romano is basically playing uh, an adult who has not been diagnosed with Asperger's, essentially. Yeah. Well, I was you wondering about that. that. There's parts, some of his like mannerisms in the yeah. movie. I was wondering if he has like ADHD or something. They don't specify. They're implying but... that he is on the spectrum. But he's so old at this point. You know, he's probably from that generation when they just. Smacked you in the back of the head. Yeah. Stand in the corner, put on the dunce cap. He's just a little odd. And now, now that you, he's on the spectrum. Give him medicine and put him, put him in a special school. Ray, Ray Romano's too old for that Ray stuff. Ray Romano's character is too old for that. So there's something wrong with him. Yeah. But he's good-hearted, and their relationship. They, they bond over kung fu movies. Yes. Yeah. Their relationship <laughs> is is plutonic. Yeah. Um, and and it's and it's great, and it's very like. It's it's very sad. It's very moving. Uh, it's I just I just loved it. Yeah. Well, it's it's emotional in the way that I mean, if an event happens to you in real life or someone you know in real life, you know, nobody has these big emotional speeches or the music swells. Mm -hmm. It's just everything just kind of happens in mm -hmm. life. And there's some wonderful dark comedy in this. The, the best scene in the movie where they go to buy the, uh, the, the the suicide drug mm -hmm. and Ray Romano insists on paying for it. And it's like, well, Mark Duplass is going to die. What does it matter if he pays for it? Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But his credit card gets declined. So as he's trying to buy the suicide drug, his credit card gets declined. <laughs> and, then, and then he goes back to the pharmacy and buys a, a little child, little girl's plastic toy safe. Yeah. So they could hide his friend's suicide medicine <laughs> in it. What, I, I don't know the combination. I was like, oh. And then that, that wonderful discussion they have, like, what's going to happen after you die? 
Oh yeah. <laughs> it's just like the very, uh, what, what kind of sign are you gonna give me? I don't know. What, 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 it's like if, if there is life after death, do you want me to, to yeah. like let you know? Do you want me to give you a sign? It's just yeah. It's, it's a conversation like I don't know, simpler people might have, and it's great. Yeah, but not in a way where the movie's talking down to them or anything. Nope. It treats um, the characters with respect, and it's a very simple movie, and it's it's just wonderfully paced and enjoyable. But then, yeah, like it says, it do, it doesn't try to pull at your heartstrings. It Which is why alone. it does pull at your heartstrings. It, it does it just feel so real. It doesn't use any of those tricks. It, and and, um, and I kind of like that, that realistic edge that he puts to all of his stuff. And I think that's, I think he does a lot of improv. Mm. And I think that's that's where that, a lot of that comes from. It's not heavily scripted yeah. and, and overly thought about. It's just like, there's people in this situation. Uh, and it's, it's not like Joe Swanberg's trash. <laughs> I watched that show Easy. Yeah. And there's absolutely no, like, it has that same kind of indie feel, like the mumblecore, like, like loosey goosey. Everyone's just kind of doing it. But his thing. stuff has no point. But there's no, like, it's trying to be observational, no but there's yes. nothing to, to drag you in Mar- or pull Mar- you in. Mark and Jay Duplass have mastered the observational mumblecore movie that has a narrative structure to it. Sure. They've combined all the elements. They don't go over the top, they don't go. Joe Swanberg, where you want to punch your TV screen and go, wait, it ended? What the fuck happened? Nothing? And then you want to punch Joe Swanberg. If you've ever seen a picture of him, he has the most punchable face. I I don't know Joe. Uh, (laughs) I I don't know if Joe knows us. I'm sorry. I don't know what your face looks like. So Jay is the one saying it's punchable. That's just, it's all on me, I guess. I think he has a very lovable face. A face, I, I would sit on his face if he would let me. Oh, you just wrote an episode of Easy. It's the entire episode. I want you to sit on my face, be, but I'm a dude. And then they'd sit around in a coffee shop for fucking 45 minutes just talking about nothing. Have you watched Easy? Talking about like making spaghetti or something. And then be like, oh, we were, you were going to sit on my face. Let's go do that oh, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, I just wrote an episode of that stupid show. Before or after the spaghetti? <laughs> During. Oh, wait, no. That's like a clever ending. Oh, yeah, no, no. It'd have to be... A spaghetti's unrelated to anything. Yeah, it would just end. It, they just talk for a while, and then something happens, and then... The, the camera would move out of, the, like, the restaurant that they're in, and there'd be a guy, like, paying his parking meter. <laughs> and, and then he, he would just, like, look at the camera, and then it would end. Yeah. Like, what, what was the parking meter all about? I don't know! <laughs> um, anyways, that's, that's... People pay parking meters in real life, man. Yeah. It's just a thing that happens, and I, I observed it with my camera. If you had to live like this, you could adapt. This is how bees see. Look at you were dead. Well, it's interesting to point out, and especially in contrast to to us, or, you know, we just did Captain Marvel, we'll be doing Shazam soon. Movies that get released in theaters now, they don't make any fucking money unless they're big comic book movies or horror films, and that's it. Yeah. It's the only, there's no, the the, the mid-budget sort of drama doesn't exist anymore. It's true. And we kind of go back and forth on Netflix. Sometimes we criticize it. We call stuff dumped on Netflix, but then they also do a lot of good. They release a lot of things that would otherwise have no place in the current uh, kind of world of theatrical films. Yeah, I, I would say most reasonable people with, with a good sense of taste w- would watch um, uh, Paddleton and get something out of it yeah. on an emotional level, on a movie level. But if Paddleton played in theaters, uh, Mr. Spielberg, in theaters <laughs> and with a wide release, yeah. it would tank. Exactly. It would sink like the fucking Titanic. Yeah. But you have to find your audience, you know. But you're right. It's a sad, sad situation. I don't, even, I, I don't even know if I'd call it a sad situation. It's just things have changed so much where they're the, the, the mid-budget movies are just, they don't get released anymore. All that, like, like, theatrical movies now are the big spectacle and nothing else. Even like 10 years ago, it was still like the Judd Apatow comedies and that kind of stuff. That stuff's gone. It is just the big tentpole stuff now. You could thank Will Ferrell for that. (laughs) And now everything else is, and it makes it harder to find stuff. Like this Paddleton movie, I'd never even heard of it. You mentioned it. Um, And it's like, oh, this is a wonderful little film. But, But it's so hard to find stuff on, one, there's so many different streaming services, but then also Netflix in particular. Stuff just gets buried because they add new things every day. Yep. Yep. The audience is so kind of like segregated on what they're looking for. Well, well, the, 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 that's a good point you raise because I think we've said this in the past is that movie theaters, uh, they, they need to 
put the seats on hydraulics now, and because they're they're, they're basically amusement park rides yes. for big movies, which is fine because I would have gone insane watching Paddleton in a theater with someone crinkling a fucking rapper in my ear. Yeah. Or someone go, this fucking sucks. <laughs> well, the benefit is no one else would be in the theater. Because <laughs> well, the movie that. would tank. <laughs> but you, you know my point. Yes. Is that yes. You, have, you have niche movies like a Paddleton that yeah, you don't go watch with a crowd of people. You watch it at your house. Yeah. On your big fucking screen TV in the dark, where it's completely quiet and no one will bother you. Right. Um, and and movie theaters, I don't care if someone's crinkling a rapper during Avengers Endgame, because it's just going to be a bunch of noise and punching panels. <laughs> and I'm okay with that. But yeah. So so it's like yeah, the the venues are changing. Yeah. Mo- movies are still being made. We always complain that nothing being made is good anymore. It's not true. There's big, stupid, dumb movies, and there's lots of smart little movies still being made. Yes. And, well, and the, the difference... hopefully they can find their money, because everything runs on money. Yeah. So if people are watching little movies on Netflix or Amazon and, and buying them, renting them, whatever, they need to generate a profit. I think the problem is, and that's the problem you had, was exposure. Mm-hmm. I had to actively go and seek this out in yeah. order to discover it. I'll go look it up. I, I have to do a lot of legwork. Yeah. Because they don't have movie advertisements for Paddleton on broadcast television. Sure. And every ad that plays before a video on YouTube is for like laundry detergent. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, where do you see trailers? Yeah. And when you go to the theater, you're going to see trailers for Thanos. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. So where do you see a trailer for Paddleton? Where is that market? Where does it happen? Yeah. It doesn't. You have to go find it. Mm-hmm. So there, there needs to be some kind of solution there because... If, if, if the free market economy will teach you anything, is people do not go out and seek products. It's very rare, mm-hmm. um, unless it's for erectile dysfunction, <laughs> or 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 it's cocaine, or you know, it's something like that. Or assisted suicide assisted drugs. Assisted suicide drugs. Um, that's why we're here, though. We're here to tell you about movies like Paddleton when we come across them, or and future movies that we happen to see on Netflix, like. What was that movie we saw recently that we recommended to people? Oh, Clovich? Clovich Killer, yeah. yeah. A movie like that. We started a whole new program for that that we've never done anything with since. Maybe we will, eventually. This this Paddleton, while you're waiting to get to the Us review, this Paddleton would have been a great uh, Mike and Jay talk about Paddleton. Yeah, but less people would have watched it than if they watched it along with our discussion of Us. Yes. So when Thanos comes out, we're reviewing six direct-to-video Netflix cancer dramas <laughs> Before we talk about Thanos. But unfortunately, Avengers Endgame is a cancer drama. Well, I mean, you see Thanos' head. I know. (laughs) Well, Mike, a couple years ago, Mark Duplass, the star of Paddleton, uh, acted in another film called The One I Love. Which I saw, which was good. I think. Uh, But his co-star in that film was Elizabeth Moss, and it turned out, spoilers for the one I love, uh, it was a doppelganger film co-starring Elizabeth Moss. Are you trying to say something about Mad Men? There's a family in our driveway. It's probably the neighbors. But y'all scared of a family? Us! Not to be confused with This Is Us, which is equally as frightening, is a new horror film from Key and Peele. Wait, I mean the cinematic genius mind of Jordan Peele, who also brought you Get Out, and will be bringing you a reboot of The Twilight Zone, starting on April 1st. And that's not an April Fool's Day joke. In Us, a family travels to Santa something or other in Cala or whatever, to go on a vacation and to a beach and discover that they have evil doppelgangers of themselves. A whole bunch of strange, gory, and scary shit happens that I can't really talk about until we get past spoilers. But suffice it to say, despite all of its originality, scares, and great performances, Us is no Captain Marvel. I don't want to say, what did you think of us? I want to say, did you like it more than Get Out? Oh my God, I was going to say that this is definitely the best M. Night Shyamalan movie that I've seen in years. That isn't really an insult either. It reminded me of an M. Night Shyamalan movie, but not one of the shitty ones. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. It, a lot of ways, like the, the type of story that's being told, the, 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 the twists and turns the story takes, uh, it all felt very M. Night Shyamalan-ish. It did. In yeah, a yeah. good way. 
I think I liked it more than Get Out. This this felt more of like a pure horror film. Get Out is obviously very, uh, there's the whole social commentary aspect. And this movie has that too, but it's more under the surface. It's this, very subdued. It's, it's much more subdued. It's there, and there's probably more ways you can interpret this than Get Out. Get Out is very... I don't want to say it's on the nose because I actually like that movie quite a bit. It's not like, I think when we talked about it, I just compared it to like late George Romero movies and those are how like, are like boom, boom. It's a little on get the it, nose. Get it, get it's out. It, it, well, it's it's specific. What what it's talking about is very specific. This movie, it, it can play as just a, a, a general horror film with a creepy premise, um, but there's more under the surface if you want to look into it. Right. And I, I, That's a smarter way to do it. I appreciate that more. I understand why people love Get Out. I understand its importance and all that stuff. Uh, but just as a pure horror movie, I like this a lot more. The only thing that kept bringing that up was uh, Elizabeth Moss and Tim Heidecker. And there was a little bit of classism there. Like, uh, Well, that's, I want to point out that the, that's kind of the, like Get Out was about race. This movie seems to be more about class. Yes. Uh, not specifically race related, although you could probably read some of that into it too. But um, we can't talk about it too much without getting into spoilers, but yeah. that's they, what they, stood out to me more. Because, you know, they, they had less of a, a strong family bond. Their little daughters were bitches, and Tim Heidecker was an asshole to his wife, and she's like, I fucking hate him. I hope he dies. <laughs> they, they have a front of a marriage. Yeah. And, 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 they try to but play they have jokingly sometimes. They try, yeah. yeah, and they have all the nice things. You know, their house is super rich. They have the Alexa thing. Um, Ophelia, I think they call yeah, it or yeah. something. Yeah, um, and, you know, they're, and they're awful, awful people. And I think... Um, the the father character says he's like oh he got the big boat you know he's trying yeah, to show there's me that, and, yeah. eh, like you said this reminds you more of a, a M Night Shyamalan movie or Twilight Zone. Here here's the thing okay. Here, and here's my review. I I really like this movie. Um, there was a point where it started to lose me where I was like, come on, no, like is this all that's gonna happen? Like, uh, okay, they got their doppelgangers. Anything that we're going to talk about before a spoilers point h has been relayed in the trailer, right? Yeah. So they, the, they go to this beach resort, and then they, the, oh, a weird family shows up in their driveway, bursts in, it's us, evil doppelganger versions of us. And then, you know, for the next, like, 20 minutes, they're battling them, and I'm like, yeah, and, and then twists and turns happen. Well, I want to mention that in relation to, I think we talked about this with Get Out, I was like, if you saw the trailer for Get Out, you kind of saw the movie. Yeah. And I was worried that's what was happening with this too, yeah. which is like, oh, it's a cool premise. It's a creepy premise, but oh, I guess it's just going to be a home invasion movie. Right. Um, but then it, it, it expands beyond that. And I was satisfied to see that. And then once it gets to that point, you kind of don't know where it's going to go. And I appreciated that. It, it kicks it up a notch, but... Um, and then let's just get into spoilers here. Spoilers! Spoilers from here on out until the, the, the end of the show. Fuck it. Fuck you! <laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> if you watch this movie as like a visceral horror kind of, because it was very tense early on when she's at the beach and she's having, she, and that beach scene early on when there's like little things that are like are setting her off and she's like really nervous and, and it's very well done. And if you just watch the movie as as a scary movie with lots of twists and, and turns and, and kind of things happening that are, are good for a horror movie, Great. If you think about the reality or the logic of the premise, it's it's borderline absurd. And, and you know, you'll have some asshole out there go, oh, how did they know this? How did they know this? Because essentially, under the ground is a secret, expansive, humongous government laboratory uh, that has a clone of a person on the surface. They're tethered, they say. They're mimicking the actions. And there's like this ridiculous, ridiculous moment when the camera's going around through this underground and there's people at a fairground upstairs doing fairground things, carnival things, riding on the rides. And everyone's mimicking, you know, what they're doing above in, in kind of like a zombie-like fashion. Yeah. And a lot of them, there's like a sailor character that walked by and... And a lot of them are wearing like the same clothes or similar. I'm like, yeah. If, if you look at it who very, who orchestrate like, all this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you look at it that literally, it is kind of silly. But uh, and I mean, where did they get 300 million orange jumpsuits? Did yeah. they sew them by? You know, <laughs> so you can. Th there'll be some asshole on the internet who goes 100 million things wrong with us. Ding. 
First of all, how did they get all those uniforms? Ding. Second of all, how did, you know? Oh. Yeah, no, it's not that kind of movie. It's it's. Uh, you have to you have to just ignore that. Yeah. Well, and it's it's also you can look at a lot of it uh, as very metaphorical, not so literal. Right. Um, like I said, kind of about class. You have the undergrounds, and they're. Uh, not treated fairly. They're not treated as well as the people above ground. Haves and the have-nots. Yes, uh, and then even on, there's a, on a minuscule level, you have that above ground, like you talked about. Uh, Tim Heidecker has the nice boat. The dad, the main character dad, has the the shitty boat. So that's like a, a smaller scale version of it. But then you have people that are are literally oppressed mm -hmm. underground. Mm -hmm. Right. So I mean, that's what the movie is. It's not about the, the literal interpretation of yeah all the inner workings of the underground. They right. almost give you more information than they should. Uh, we, we often talk about, like, you need to have specific rules or mythology to things, but you it's either that or you have to go the other end, yeah. which is like the Night of the Living Dead. People are coming back from the dead. We don't know why, they just are. Keep it very vague. It was, this movie kind of goes a little too far, or not far enough in yeah. either direction. The scene where the um, doppelganger version of Lupito Nyong'o is drawing on the, draw, the chalkboard, drawing the Hands Across America yep. logo, and she's basically like explaining the plot, like mm -hmm. the, uh, we live down here and we do that. And I was like, oh no, don't say it all. And then the very, very ending, um, when uh, they're driving and, and she's, she's having flashbacks to the, the girl not talking, mm -hmm. her as her younger self. Yeah. They can't get her done. And I was like, oh dang. <laughs> and then it's like shoo, shoo, flashback, flashback. Eh, 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 eh. The, the, the entire method of the, the doppelganger of her as a little girl, stealing her, yeah. pulling her in, putting a different sweatshirt on her. I was like, no, I got it from just showing me that one scene yeah, exactly. in the therapist's office. And then it needed to cut to her just like kind of smirking at the kid. Mm -hmm. The kid knew. Yeah. He's like, mm. and I was like, that's just boom, cut it there. Don't tell us, don't give us all this information. We yeah. don't need to know it. And it's like, the, I think, the, he, I think he was probably, Jordan Peele was probably worried that it would be too vague. And it probably would be for a lot of people. So it's like, uh, uh, he tries to give you more information, but by giving more information and making it slightly more literal, that's what it kind of falls apart in the context of like picking apart the, the reality of how this place would work and yeah. how the events would happen, so. I mean, it's a, that's a tough a tough thing to sell. And, and I would have been, I thought it went over the line with the fact that, and it was a wonderful, clever analogy with the Hands Across America. Remind me to tell you a story about Hands Across America. Okay. Um, where, yeah, you had this like, we're all unified and, uh, and her having the Hands Across America t-shirt is, is sort of the catalyst of um, of her whole plan to yeah. break everybody out and do this thing where they're all holding hands. This is this was genius, genius framing device. Yeah, show her looking at that T-shirt. Show the, the people holding hands, and but that's all it, you need. They think like us. They know where we are. Jordan Peele is is writing a very fine line between having this great imagination. Of, of a storyline. Great premises, a great concept. Yeah, and then that, that you know, because you don't want a scientist coming in. We've, we cloned the Heidecker family, and we cloned <laughs> your family, and a half a dozen others in this little small town is an experiment to see if we could send your families off and turn them into super soldiers, and blah, 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 blah. You don't want that. Yeah. And, and then also, in my opinion, you don't want hands across America number of people because then you go where, where, <laughs> where how did they do that? how did they know Lupito Nyong'o was going to marry I forget the husband's name the dad yeah how did they know he and then how did they get their DNA I, at, at one point I thought hey maybe they're like at night this like machine like sweeps through the the, the water you know and, and where everyone was swimming and playing at the beach and, and steals all the human DNA out of the oh water. Oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, that makes sense. All the beach goers are being cloned because yeah. they're at the beach. But then I was like, I gotta stop thinking about this. It's insane. Yeah. This premise is insane. <laughs> you just gotta ignore it and focus on the characters and the family and their the, and the sequence of events and, and kind of just the thrill ride the, of it all. Yeah, the concept is great. The execution of a lot of the sequences is fantastic. Um, and that's that's the good stuff that kind of happened with Get Out too. how it's like once you discover what the 
is actually going on. And then we see that they're like, like, like literally like removing brains and putting them into other people. It's like, okay, you're pushing it too far. Yes. And that's, um, that's the thing is like, is like he is really good at building tension and, and the actors, the, the performances are great that just the way it's shot. I mean, great director, uh, good writer. Uh, uh, he, great concepts. Great concepts. Good execution. Good-ish execution. I would say very good execution. Well, from a filmmaking standpoint, uh, executing of uh, concept, a story yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. He could take a premise, uh, some lunatic premise, you know, this is killer bees flying around, and uh, <laughs> when a bee stings you, it, it takes your soul, and, uh, and then they fly back to a government lab, and the honey they make. <laughs> Fuels a spaceship to Mars, <laughs> you know. And then, to, okay, and then Jordan Peele could take that and kind of make, make that good, and make it classy, yeah. And then to where you believe it, mm -hmm. and that's kind of what these like the swapping of the brains and and, and Get Out, and um, you could have just done that with the therapist with Catherine Keener, kind of doing like weird therapy More tricks, psychological thing, yeah, yeah. Instead of literally moving a brain, um, that's why I think Jordan Peele is going to be great doing. Uh, Twilight Zone. I'm looking forward to his Twilight um, Zone. Because Twilight yeah. Zone episodes are a little, a little yeah. goofy at times. Well, um, that's that's even if if the 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 final result of the story isn't perfect, I, I appreciate that Jordan Peele seems to really love and embrace horror, and making horror films. Yeah. Um, he doesn't kind of look down on it. It's not like a like a cheap like a lot of it's, it's a it Blumhouse with movie with class. Yeah, like a lot of the Blumhouse movies. Some of them are very good, but a lot of them are like Truth or Dare. We saw that one, where they're just like cheap, like we want to make a buck movies. And I will take um, Jordan Peele's like, like premises, even though they're a little, a little strange. They are creative and different. Yeah. And I will take his films over a Truth or Dare, or <laughs> over even to, at this point like a Conjuring kind of movie, where it's like a, there's a demon in, in the house and it's gonna yeah. throw you against the wall. I'm just like sick of that. Well, those are all about the the visceral experience, yeah. and and Jordan Peele's movies have an element to that, but there's also a little bit more going on. They're they're they're, they're from like a different perspective almost a, no, for, yeah. of horror, and yeah. and and that's. Uh, and that's refreshing. And everything, uh, I know you just did your Rocketeer review, mm -hmm. which probably won't be up when this goes up, but. You make a point of mentioning how every little thing is set up and paid off in that, and I was noticing that a lot in this movie too. Every, like even the, the first shot of the movie is that TV, and it's the, the Hands Across America commercial. And I was just thinking, like, oh, that's a funny thing from the 80s. And this takes place in the 80s. They're just doing a little reference to that. But then so much of the movie relies on that. And then um, there's, a, there's a reoccurrence of uh, the number 11. Yes. And 1111, um, which is reminiscent of a now-canceled show called Here and Now on HBO, starring Tim Robbins, mm. uh, which was a spooky, psychological, time-spacey show about uh, a reoccurrence of the numbers 1111. Oh. Um, and so, yeah, even that opening. The, 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 they, they say from the, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, which is two upright things, to the Twin Towers of New York City, which is two uprights, 11. What has 12 million eyes, over 50 million fingers, and reaches from the Statue of Liberty all the way to the Pacific Ocean? Oh. 11 on each coast. I didn't read that anywhere. I just thought of that. I, I, did, not, I did not notice uh, that. But I wasn't thinking of 1111 when I saw that scene, obviously. So. I thought of it in, this, this in will, hindsight. Okay, this will benefit on repeat viewings because I noticed like 1111. There was something about that on the, the TV when the dad was watching sports. Uh, it's a kit reoccurring. And then even other little things like the, the early scene with they first get to that summer house and they're all sitting around the, the dinner table talking and chatting and they feel very natural. Like they're all great. Like it feels like a real family. Uh, but then we get almost a similar kind of setup with them around the table later in the movie when they kill mm. Elizabeth Moss and Tim Heidecker, and we get another scene with them sitting around the dinner table in a completely different environment. Like, all that stuff was great. And the two twin daughters. The twin daughters, yeah, yeah. Who also have doppelgangers. 11-11. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Two normal daughters, two evil doppelgangers. Mm -hmm. um, but then even little just story things, like uh, that first dinner scene, the daughter is talking about how she, she's like, if we're out here, can I drive? Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, you can't drive. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then later she drives. So just simple little setup and payoff stuff like that. Uh, well, so yeah. just a, a really like well-constructed script. Um, right. The little boy with his, uh, the, the toy ambulance blocks yeah. the door. 
Yeah. And then what do they drive home in the end? Yeah, yeah. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, not only does the toy ambulance come back, he uses that to outwit his doppelganger. Well, but, yeah, then, yeah. but then, yeah. That's an obvious setup for the thing later, which yeah. is a basic setup, but the, the, uh, the metaphor, the visual of a little tiny ambulance, that's what helps them. Later on, a real ambulance helps them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, whether intended or unintended, uh, lots of lots of little details in this that a second viewing would would help, you know? Sure. Um, we get in the very first shot of the film, we see a VHS copy of Chud. Uh, cannibalistic human underground dwellers. Mm -hmm. Starring the guy from Home Alone, Macaulay Culkin. Yes. I I'm speculating. Um, I'm just going to throw this out there. Uh, I think there's opening text before the film starts. Um, and I'm going to guess that that was a studio thing going, you should probably put something in the beginning because people are really fucking confused. <laughs> it opens with black, uh, black screen and, and white text. It's like, in America, there are millions of miles of underground tunnels. Do you yeah. remember this? From oh, yeah. subway, abandoned subway lines to mine shafts and about mm. some, some thousands and thousands of miles of tunnels have no noticeable purpose whatsoever. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that's now... Keep, keep that in your mind. That's yeah. now in my brain because she goes into Merlin's magical haunted house <laughs> and then somehow ends up like in down staircases, down a magical escalator. Yeah. And you're like, where the fuck is she? And I'm, I'm sure during, they had some test screenings and someone said, how big was Merlin's magical castle? <laughs> you know, and they said she acted. That was the secret entrance to the government laboratory that is underneath the entirety of the United States. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Will there be complimentary donuts after the screening? Can you write something about the miles and miles of secret tunnels? <laughs> Uh, this is a, some elderly was yelling. That. Oh, okay. Um, but so I have a feeling that was. It's possible. Was, yeah. Or he just wanted to make sure that specific point was clear. I don't know. He doesn't seem to be too. He he. That's that's what I like too about Jordan Peele's movies is uh, they have this sort of kind of social aspect to them, but they also just work as kind of a broad entertainment mm -hmm. where you can just watch it as like a, a solid horror film. Oh yeah, yeah. So he's he's not trying to make like the most like really abstract, you know, symbolic. Yeah. Um, you know, there's metaphorical aspects, but it, it plays as a, a crowd pleaser. Well, and also when it's more kind of subtle and under the surface, like under the surface, mm -hmm. um, it's open to more interpretations. Yes. Like, I, like I mentioned, Get Out is very specific. Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, I, I can see people talking about this movie and, yeah, you know. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. a lot to decode. Like when, when the doppelganger says, uh, she's like, what are you? And she's like, we're Americans. Yeah. And so that was, that had a lot of like, oh. It's like we're, we are also Americans. We deserve, yeah. we deserve the same rights as you, but we're, we're suppressed underground. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. fine stuff. And oh. Lupita Nyong'a, oh, she special mention to her. Excellent. She's going to get Tony Collette this year at the Oscars. Oh. <gasps> Hands across America, a human chain 4,000 miles long, ocean to ocean, coast to coast. Uh, I had to chuckle because the Hands Across America thing, because I remember that shit. Cause I did that shit. Oh my god! Uh, and I have, I have a lovely little story to tell. Okay. Um, they 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 basically tell you what it is in the ad. It's just like shared like a fundraising thing for I think to feed people. Yeah, it was for well, that's uh, again tying in with the theme of the movie and people, uh, the 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 high class and low class. It was all about like yeah, like helping the homeless, helping the homeless people that are yeah. Um and 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 it was basically like just a a gimmick. Literally, there weren't hands holding hands across the country because of, uh, you know, mountains, uh, roads, roads, airports, private property, uh, physical barriers that would probably be impossible, sure. but they had set up little routes and they're like, eh, okay, this city, you know, you go from here to here, eh, this city, eh, if you're in involved in this, go from here to here. And so uh, uh, my mom was like, are we doing hands across America? Put a quarter in the bucket. And we're gonna stand here and hold hands with a bunch of strangers down the sidewalk. And I was like, "This is so stupid." <laughs> I'm like, "What?" Well, I learned many lessons that day as, as a wee lad. I was like, "This is the dumbest thing in the world because this isn't gonna do anything. Yeah. This is just some kind of showy thing." And people are still hungry. 
So it didn't solve any fucking problems. Um, but we're all standing there and on the sidewalk, a very long amount of people. And I'm like, how long do we have to do this for? This sucks. Um, just shut up and do it. It's helping the homeless somehow. Um, then out of nowhere, a kind of a guy in like dirty jeans and he had, I remember he had long dirty hair and a big like handlebar mustache. He's like, it's like he comes out into the middle of the street and goes, okay, okay, here's what we're gonna do everybody. Uh, I'm gonna need everybody to come on out this way. Uh, we're moving the line, we're moving the line everybody. And, 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 and I'm like, what? And so everybody goes out into the middle of the street and then the guy runs away and traffic starts coming. <laughs> And everybody scatters. <laughs> and, and, and that was the day I, I learned to avoid groupthink. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> so Mike, would you recommend us? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The foundation of the premise is, is, is a little ridiculous, bordering on science fiction. Virtually unbelievable in its practicality. The surface on top of that, the thrills, the scares, the, the performances, uh, everything that makes up everything on top of that works so well. I will, I will take uh, overly ambitious but sloppy over uh, the, the Conjuring 5 <laughs> any day of the week. <laughs> But what about Wish Upon? Well, I mean, nothing's going to top Wish Upon. This is no. This is no Wish Upon. This is no Wish Upon. But uh, uh, it's just nice to see like a like a mainstream wide release horror film that feels like a horror film that doesn't feel like a cheap studio gimmick or just a cash grab. Right. Like uh, Jordan Peele, he knows his shit. He cares about horror clearly, uh, and he's he's trying to make good stuff. Yes. There's one like interesting thing about the movie though. Mm. The guy who played Elizabeth Moss's husband looks like our old manager, Tim. Oh, you know, I didn't even think about that. I was watching the movie, I was like, who does he remind me yeah, of? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's weird, he really looks like him. Yeah. But I don't think it's him. No, it couldn't be. Could it? By the way, Joe Pilato died today. I know. That's sad. Have I told you my Joe Pilato story? <laughs> uh, 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 R.I.P. Joe Pilato. You brought us many minutes of joy in cinema. <laughs> Mainly this one. I'm running this monkey farm now, Frankenstein, and I want to know what the fuck you're doing with my time. <laughs> <laughs>